Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naomi Kramer. I'm with the Holocaust Education and Genocide Prevention Foundation. It's been 30 years that we've organized the symposium on Holocaust and Genocide at Banyi. And I'm very proud today to introduce speakers. They're young Austrians from, well, obviously Austria. In lieu of military service, they're here working for the foundation that I'm with, and they will do a very interesting presentation on the role of propaganda. So with that, Leonie and Maximilian. Okay. Um, I'm going to start our presentation by giving you a brief overview of the topics we're going to cover. Um, as Naomi said, we are Gedenkdiener. Um, at first, we will explain to you what that means and why we are doing it. Um, then I will address the Nazi rise to power and the role propaganda played in it. And finally, Maximilian is going to talk about propaganda today. Um, we would really appreciate questions and comments. Um, so feel free <laughs> to ask um, during the presentation or afterwards. Okay, in, in Austria, every male citizen at the age of 17 has to perform either a compulsory military service for six months, or you can do an alternative like a civil service. Um, this is like working for the ambulance or working at a retirement home. There's also the Austrian Service Abroad, um, an organization established in the early 90s uh, by a political science professor, Andreas Meislinger. This organization offers three different types um, of services. First, the Gedenkdienst, that's our service. Um, it's called Memorial Service in English, which is by far the largest one and the type it shows. Yeah. The Friedensdienst, it's a peace service in English and the Sozialdienst, social service. This year, 100 young um, Austrians like us are doing their 10-month service uh, in over 40 different countries with four um, Gedenkdieners in Canada, three in Montreal, and one in Toronto. Uh, we work uh, in Holocaust remembrance organizations and museums, as well as Jewish organizations, in order to commemorate the Holocaust uh, and, and the war crimes com uh, committed by the National Socialists. Before you uh, can do a so, uh, service abroad, you have to work in, in the organization for some time, attend conferences and events, and read books what, and watch movies to have a proper education. Um, about 10% of the applicants will actually do a service abroad. The rest will, uh, is going to drop out during the process. It is uh, not only possible to do that in lieu of military, but also as a volunteer, a Cleone. Uh, it was clear for me from the beginning that I would have never done, ever done a military service. I heard the stories about, like, from my father, his brothers, and other male relatives about uh, military. He told me about a redundant tasks like cleaning firearms uh, three times just to learn discipline. And furthermore, I believe that military resistance should not be um, something a country's first means of conflict resolution. In this in this contemporary world, we can dissolve ourselves uh, with a flick of a finger. This is not something um, we should aim for in a conflict resolution. When I first heard about the Gedenkdienst program and the Austrian service abroad uh, from a friend, I immediately knew that this is the thing I want to do. I grew up in a country that um, took part in a horrendous genocide. I heard stories about the war from my grandparents, and I recently found out that uh, one of my great grandparents was actually a member of the NSDAP, the National Socialist Party. I'm aware that I can't change the past, but I can, um, but I can influence the future. And it's, it, but, and it's our task to shape the future and keep the memory alive. Uh, furthermore, I see my potential better used in such a program um, instead of working for an emergency service and assisting with 911 calls, uh, since I believe I'm not the person that can handle such a task on a longer term. Also, the fact that I will spend a year abroad was an important factor. Uh, for me, growing up in Austria also means growing up with the history of the Holocaust and the Second World War. 
because we grow up in a country with visual reminders, um, with places where these tragedies happen and with memorials, which remind us of them. But in most cases, there's also more personal connection to this dark chapter of the past, um, because every Austrian family has a connection, uh, whether as victim, perpetrator, or bystander. And although these things happened 80 years ago and were experienced by my great grandparents, which I never met, um, they, I feel a connection to them and they affect me. Because sometimes these feelings um, and this heritage can feel like a burden, but I try to see them as an opportunity because through this connection, the Holocaust and war mean more to me than just another history lesson from school because it's the history of my country and of my family. Um, on the slide, you can see some documents from my family connected to national socialism. One of my great grandparents was imprisoned for two years in concentration camps as a political opponent um, on the right. That's the picture taken at his arrest in Vienna. And um, underneath the small picture is um, a document from the concentration camp at, Mount, uh, at Dachau, which um, contains his personal information. And other great grandparents um, and late relatives were soldiers in the Wehrmacht, in the German army, and they were fighting for Germany. While men were fighting, uh, women had to work for the war industry. So on the left, you can see the cover of a document from my grandmother's aunt, which lists all the jobs she had during the war time. And the second picture from the left is the birth certificate of my grandmother. She was born in 1944 in Vienna. And as you can see, there are stamps with the typical Nazi symbols on this document. Um, I know that the atrocities that happened were not my fault, but I feel like it's my responsibility to try to prevent them in the future, because especially from my Austrian background, I should know better and I should have learned from history. So that's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing as a memorial intern. I tried to tell the story of the Holocaust, the history of the Holocaust from my Austrian um, background in order to try to assume this responsibility, I feel. But now let's get to the real topic um, and ask ourselves how all the horrible atrocities committed by the National Socialists and their accomplices were possible and why so many people in Germany and the neighboring countries supported Hitler and his policies. In order to understand that, we have to take a look at Germany at the beginning of the 1930s. At that time, Germany was afflicted by a variety of problems. Following the Treaty of Versailles after World War I, Germany had to pay compensation payments and these payments were a heavy burden on the German economy, which was already affected by the lost war. And in addition to that, the Great Depression of 1929 also reached Europe and Germany. And the consequences were hyperinflation, poverty, and unemployment of millions of people in Germany. But the lost war was not only um, affecting the economy. Many Germans experienced the defeat as a national humiliation and they did not concede it. Uh, third issue was the missing stability and the lack of trust in democracy because the Weimar Republic was established after World War I, but it was not welcomed by all parts of society. And many people were frustrated by the government's inability to deal with the economic and social crisis. So all these factors resulted in fertile soil for the growth of radical movements um, like the Nazi party. The Nazis promised 
to pull Germany out of the depression, to restore German cultural values, to reverse the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles, put the German people back to work, and to restore Germany to its rightful position as a world power. The um, poster, the first one reads, our last hope, Hitler. Um, and the second one shows a typical German Aryan man um, building uh, up Germany. Um, so this is the comparison, the um, frustrated people and what uh, Hitler aimed to um, build <laughs> Germany up again and make them proud again. Hitler and other Nazis were um, highly successful in directing the population's anger and the fear against the Jews and other minorities. Many people in Germany were willing to blame the most convenient scapegoat for all the problems they faced. And the scapegoat was the Jews. Uh, but Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists did not invent anti-Semitism. For hundreds of years, Jews have been victims of prejudice, stereotypes, and discrimination. The hostile attitude towards Jews was, and in part is until today, based on the difference in religion and the um, stereotype of Jews being rich and economically more successful. So the Nazis built on what already existed, transformed it and made it government policy. But what was new about the anti-Semitism that evolved and increased during the years leading up to the Nazi rule was the concept of the Jews as a race. For Hitler, there existed a hierarchy of values with regard to human beings. The Aryan race, to which all the true Germans belonged, was the greatest, and Jews and other minorities were seen as, an, as inferior races. And the blood of these inferior races had contaminated that of the Germans in the eyes of the National Socialists. An election in July 1932 made the National Socialists the largest political party in Germany. On January the 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. And two months later, the Reichstag, the German parliament, adopted the Enabling Act. This act allowed Hitler to enact new laws without interference from the parliament or the president. All existing political parties were banned. From now on, Germany was a single party state. Under the National Socialists, Germany was therefore ruled as a dictatorship. Propaganda was an important element that enabled the Nazis to rise to power and to gain support for their policies against the Jews and other minorities. Um, and because only a month after the Nazi party came to power, the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda was created under Josef Goebbels. That shows the priority that Hitler and the party placed on propaganda. The term propaganda originates from the Sacred Congregation of Propaganda, which was established by Pope Gregory the 15th in 1622 to spread the faith of Catholicism. So in this sense, propaganda originally meant to propagate or disseminate information. But speaking about propaganda today, we define it as a means of influencing mass public opinion trying to gain support for a movement or a certain cause. Propaganda aims to incite action, and often this action is intended against a group or a certain cause. Propaganda usually appeals to the emotions and not to the intellect, and by doing so, it presents one's opinion as facts. So propaganda blurs the lines between fact and fiction. A propagandist's message also does not have to be obvious. 
It can also be very subtle or even subliminal, and that's making it even more difficult to detect this intentional distortion of fact and fiction. Subliminal propaganda may be less aggressive, but it can be as um, eff effective in the long term. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler wrote about propaganda. To whom should propaganda be addressed? It must be addressed always and solely to the masses. It must be directed toward the emotions and only to a very limited extent toward the so-called intellect. The receptive ability of the masses is very limited. Their intelligence is small, their forgetfulness enormous. Therefore, all propaganda has to limit itself to a very few points and repeat them like slogans until even the very last man is able to understand what you want him to understand. The Nazi propaganda was very effective because it extended to all areas of German public and private life. Through different forms of communication, Germans were influenced and indoctrinated with the goals and the ideology of the Nazis. This photograph, the first one, shows a group of German children reading a typical anti-Semitic book. The title of the book is Der Giftpilz, which means in English, the poisonous mushroom. In this book, uh, Jews are compared to toxic mushrooms that multiply and spread, poisoning everything with which they come in contact. The other book on the right is another example of anti-Semitic children's propaganda. On the left, a physical, healthy, blonde, and blue-eyed Aryan workman is um, shown. And on the right, a fat Jew smoking a cigar and carrying a briefcase. The briefcase is symboli symbolizing his role as the greedy money lender. So these images taught German children to racially label and distinguish between Aryans and Jews. The board game in the middle also shows how children were targeted and influenced by the Nazi propaganda. The name of the game is Juden Raus, which means Jews out. The first player to move six Jews out of the walls of the German city is the winner of this game. And especially interesting is that the squares outside the city walls are labeled Sammelplatz, which means collection point. And the exact same term was later given to the actual collection points from which Jews were taken to the ghettos and deported to the camps. Youth was further targeted um, through the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls. These were youth groups developed by the Nazi party to in introduce children between 10 and 18 years old to Nazi ideology and policy. Through these organizations, the Nazi regime planned to indoctrinate young people with their ideology. The Hitler Youth became the only legal youth movement in Nazi Germany and the regime threatened to punish those who failed to comply. Jews were not allowed to join these groups. Concerning family, the Nazi propaganda showed that a woman's place was strictly in the home as mother and child bearer. Racially pure women were encouraged to bear as many children as possible and child rich families were awarded the cross of honor of the German mother when they had four or more children. Nazi propaganda also entered the world of sports. Uh, Non-Aryans were systematically include, excluded from German sports facilities and associations starting in 1933. And in 1936, 
Germany hosted the Summer Olympics in Berlin and the regime exploited these games to show the world an um, um, image of a peaceful and tolerant Germany. At the same time, Germany wanted to promote the myth of Aryan racial superiority and physical strength. The Nazis also tried to control culture. This is the cover of the, a brochure for the exhibition Decadent Music. Because of its black origins, jazz was considered to be below German moral standards and aesthetically inferior to the typical German music. Modernist music and jazz music were therefore banned under the National Socialists. On the 10th of May, 1933, uh, Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, organized the public burning of un-German books. These books were either written by Jewish authors or expressed ideas that were deemed incompatible with or in opposition to the Nazi ideology. To spread their propaganda, the National Socialists used all types of media available at that time. The Volksempfänger was, um, or Der Stürmer, they were newspapers featuring anti-Semitism and the race ideology of the Nazis. The newspapers were not only read privately, but they were also presented to the public for everyone to read, like you can see in the picture in the middle. Der Volksempfänger, sorry, I confused the name before, the newspaper was Der Völkische Beobachter und Der Stürmer. Der Volksempfänger was the radio promoted um, by the National Socialists. It was first presented in 1933. And with the radio, the Nazis aimed to reach an even greater part of the population. All the programs were controlled by the Nazis and listening to foreign radio programs was strictly forbidden. TVs did not yet exist during the Nazi regime. Nevertheless, the Nazis produced propaganda films to show them in movie theaters, a prominent figure in the film industry at that time was the German director Leni, Lief Leni Riefenstahl. Her films included very little dialogue, but they were very effective. She made many propaganda movies for the National Socialists. And I'm going to show you a clip of one of them called Triumph of the Will, which was presented in 1934. The purpose of the film was to depict the spectacle, energy and solidarity of the Reich. The Nazi party should be associated with a sense of community and fun, as you will see. If I should be able to start it.
the Nazi propaganda changed over time. The process of depicting Jews as the enemies of the Aryan race, which finally led to the mass killings of the Shoah, was a gradual process. Um, at first, Jews were only presented with big noses as greedy for money, um, as we've seen in the examples before. But with the time, German propaganda against the Jews became more and more radical, aggressive, and humiliating. The next film clip I'm going to show you is from the film Der Ewige Jude, The Eternal Jew. This film was filmed with inmates from the Warsaw and Lodz ghettos, and it compares Jews to rats and presents them as criminals. The film is not available today, so that's a very old version and the subtitles, the English subtitles are very hard to read. So we muted the film and I'm going to read the text in English out to you during the film. Rats are insidious, cowardly, and cruel. They appear in huge packs. They represent the very essence of malicious and subterranean destruction, just like the human counterparts, the Jews. In 1932, the Jews, who were only 1% of the world population, were found to represent 34% of the illegal drug trade. 47% of gambling, 82% of major organized crime, and 98% uh, of prostitution. The Jewish parasites make up a large part of international criminality. It is no coincidence that the professional jargon of the criminal community is largely derived from Hebrew and Yiddish. These facial characteristics refuse all liberal theories about the equality of mankind. These Jews change their outer appearance as they leave their ghetto nests to invade the surrounding community. The Telis beard, stuff cap, and caftan are their distinguishing traits. Remove them, and only the well-trained observer can see truth for what they, they are. It is a natural characteristic of the Jew to always hide any sign of his racial origin. Here we see a group of Polish Jews, as described earlier. Now we see them trying to assimilate and insinuate themselves into West European circles. From the point of view of the Nazis, the threat to Aryan racial purity, as they call it, by the Jews combined with all the other problems, required a strong leader who would protect the German blood and liberate the German nation from the international influence and control of a Jewish conspiracy. Hitler, der Führer, and National Socialism were therefore presented as the savior of Germany, as we can see in these two propaganda pictures. So propaganda encouraged people to develop or reinforce their stereotypes and prejudice 
which can lead to discrimination and in the case of the Holocaust led to the Shoah and to murder. Propaganda today comes in many different forms. Companies try to convince us to buy their products or politicians want us to vote for them in the next election. Both parties have one in common. They, they present you what you want to hear and leave out all the disadvantages um, of, the, of the product or of the party. Nowadays, it's easier to trick people than ever before. With social media, brands and politicians can have a perf perfectly personalized story um, and advertisements for people like you. While Hitler used propaganda more uh, in a more general way to convince people uh, of Germany, advertisement nowadays targets a very, sm very small target group. This small method is called micro-targeting. The population becomes divided into small demographic, religious, political, and much more target groups based on scientific and statistic analysis. Uh, based on research data, communication stra strat strategies uh, can define the perfect advertisement for each of those groups. The, the content gets delivered uh, to you by social media. One example where micro-targeting changed the outcome of an election was in 2008, where the Obama's uh, campaign team relied heavily on the method uh, in swing states, which resulted in a victory for the Democrats. Nowadays, almost every political party invests millions of dollars in social media marketing. The Trump uh, 2020 campaign, for example, invested 107 million US dollars on Facebook ads. Facebook and co collects, uh, collects and processes tons of uh, personal data for you, of you. Since uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever is free, they have to earn money with advertisements. The more ads you see, the more money they earn. In their, so it's in their highest interest to keep you as long as possible uh, on their platform. Every click and every scroll defines your personal profile uh, on the service of Facebook. Based on this profile, they show you uh, content and ads they think you like. If, if, if you do so, they will show you more uh, of that similar content. This eventually leads to uh, you as a user living in a biased system. If you're uh, more a Democrat, you will most likely see a poster uh, represent a similar political view. Uh, in case of conspiracy theories, this confirmation bias leads to uh, more and more extreme content and opinions. Here, this is the this is a Venn diagram. On the left is there's the there are the facts and evidence and our beliefs and in the the part that is like combined is the evidence we believe. Um, in 2021, the whistleblower Francis Hagen, a former product manager at Facebook, uh, leaked internal research documents, stated the conflict of interest about security of users and profit um, for the company. Facebook chose the profit uh, over the welfare of its users and the society multiple times. Content that is polarizing or encourages hate speech produces higher attention and thus higher rated and this test higher rated by the algorithms. Internal studies stated this problem. Uh, Facebook altered the algorithms for the presidential, presidential election in 2020, but changed it uh, back after. This is one example that shows uh, the problem with advertisement and social media. Another one is the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, Cambridge Analytica was a company located in NYC accused of having severe influence uh, in the 2016 presidential election. The firm had secured a $15 million investment from Robert Mercer, a wealthy Republican donor, and wrote his political advisors uh, with the promise of tools that could identify the personality of American voters and influence their voting behavior. The company started harvesting pri private profile uh, informations of over 80 million Facebook uh, users without your permissions, which is one of the largest data, data leaks in the social network's history. Uh, Cambridge paid uh, to acquire the personal information through an outside researcher uh, who claimed uh, to, be, to be collecting it for academic purposes. This allowed the company to develop uh, techniques that underprint Trump's campaign in 2016. 
they started working for Ted Cruz in the primaries, another Republican. And um, Cruz fired Cambridge after the predictions for the voting behavior was incorrect. Mercer started supporting Trump with Cambridge Analytica, who was an outside candidate at that time. With their data model called Ocean, they developed uh, profiles for 220 million US citizens, uh, which was also used for uh, ads. Cambridge Analytica identified potential swing states that were known as democratic strongholds, um, like Wisconsin. Hillary Clinton uh, didn't have a campaign appearance in Wisconsin, but Trump had, based on Cambridge Analytica data, the, so the Republicans won, um, surprisingly with a small lead in that state. Christopher Whaley, who helped founding the company and worked there until 2014, stated later that rules didn't matter for the leaders and that this was a cultural war for the board of, the, of Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is, all, is just one of the major examples how people use our data to manipulate and influence us. How false information is spread. False information can be spread intentionally and unintentionally. An unintentional spread of false information is called disinformation, misinformation. This could be a friend who tells you uh, wrong facts about an assignment you have to do uh, for a university or a news show that did uh, mass research. The difference uh, is the amount of people influenced. In the first example, uh, it's only one person, but the news show has a multi-million audience. Intentional spread of fake news, on the other hand, is called disinformation. A great example are, are conspiracy theories. The fear of the people missing and, and the missing ability to explain certain constructs in our uh, modern world leads to seemingly easy explanations of complex questions. Believers also um, get the feeling of intelligence since they think they know something others don't. But those conspiracy theories can lead to severe damage. The terror attack in Christchurch in 2019, where over 50 people of two mosques died, was carried out by right-wing extremists. In, seven, in his 74-page long manifest, he speaks of the Great Replacement, uh, a right um, extremist conspiracy theory whose supporters believe that, they, uh, that the population of Europe is going to be, be replaced by immigrants, mostly from the East due to their high birth rate. Even some members of the German parliament of the far-right party AFD, which stands for Alternative for Germany, believe in that story. And this is uh, only one of many examples how this information can harm people. The most, one of the most recent ones is probably the conspiracy theory about COVID. And here you can see the, the David Starr with uh, unvaccinated in the middle. Uh, right now, this is, uh, I think, illegal in Berlin to wear a David Starr like this. Um, the supporter of the, uh, of the uh, COVID conspiracy theories mostly claim that COVID is a hoax and the vaccine is made to decimate the population or, or to survey people with a microchip. Um, some less extreme claims about the pandemic, how they call it, um, are about the effectiveness, effect, effectiveness uh, of the vaccine. The most people of the, uh, the most of the approved vaccines are made uh, with the new technology, the mRNA technology and are, are developed in an unusual short time. Um, those factors cause uncertainty in the uh, people's minds, which is fertile soil uh, for conspiracy theories. Supporters believe that the vaccine can harm, uh, harm them more than COVID. It spread most, uh, the fake news is spread mostly over the internet in these certain telegram groups. Um, all the evidence that support the theory are easy to disprove. They are often word of, uh, of mouth by some people who claim to work in the hospital and see a lot of patients um, that were harmed by the vaccine. There are also people that spread those uh, conspiracy informations intentionally to profit uh, from the outcome. One example are people who sell fake vaccine passes. Um, when you go to, the, to get the vaccine in Europe, um, you usually get like a sticker, uh, a doctor stamp and the signature in a yellow pass. And some people bought some of those um, empty yellow passes and in big quantity and fake stamps and stickers and forged the signatures to sell them um, over Telegram. Here you can see um, the triangle for the focus squares the theories, like the, the slippery slope. Um, first of all, you're grounded in reality and then you, you start thinking and you start questioning things like you should usually do. But then you get to um, unreal, 
liable sources like um, Russia Today, for example, and you get more and more into um, into reality denial. And there's also something called like the anti-Semitic point of no return, where you where you're basically so detached from the reality that it's really hard to get you back to the reality. A lot of people um, think they are immune against advertisement and propaganda, but it's almost uh, always a misbelief. It's uh, mostly not the intention of advertisement to get a call to action decision immediately after viewing it. Um, this leads to this uh, misbelief that you're immune. But when you, when you see advertisement and advertisement framing and propaganda more often, it shapes our opinion and our feelings about the product or political candidate. The mo most people don't buy or vote based on regional criteria. They vote out of sympathy or personal beliefs and buy, buy out of emotional decisions and feelings. For some people that may, uh, may be different, but it's, but it's not, but those are entire percent racial and are still a minority of people. And political parties are doing the exact same thing. You don't have to vote, but you probably will. Uh, this leaves you in a situation where you have to make a decision you feel good with. And usually you don't agree 100% with one political party. Um, the political candidates are working hard to get you to, uh, to vote for them and use ads and propaganda to convince you. Uh, with more uh, and better ads, they target you and want to get into your head with uh, smart and provoking slogans. This is also a construct uh, right-wing politicians are often using. The right uh, populist party, Freedom Party uh, Austria, or short FPÖ, uh, claimed a lot of problems in the last years on uh, foreign people and immigrants from the Orient, like Turks or Syrians. Those parties are, one, uh, are on the right end um, of the discourse and are mostly trying to, uh, to find easy answers to complex questions. Here are two posters of this party. The left poster says, um, the Hamstadt Islam, it's German and it means homestead is homeland instead of Iceland. And it also says, we are for you. And the right poster says like, uh, love of country instead of Moroccan thieves and competence means August 10th. It's, the, it's another slogan on that. Um, on that poster, and the, those those slogans are of course very controversial and very uh, controversially debated because they because at least the right um, slogan is very racist. Um, but those are good examples how how right wing politicians state uh, like um, how, how right wing politicians are manipulating us. There are two, also two social media posts I found on the internet um, posted by meme accounts. Those accounts are usually not run by politicians, but by supporters of the party. On the left side, you can see a famous picture um, where everyone is doing the Hitler greeting except for one person. And the guy who made that meme states that the AFD, the alternative for Germany, um, the far right um, extremist party in Germany is the only, uh, party that is not following um, not following the consent the consents and like uh, not following the lies and all the other parties um, around and the, and the public uh, broadcasting companies are like following the, the lies on the right side you, uh, there is one one from the Republicans um, it states like the, the, the Democrats they are just leftists and the, the Republicans are the wealthy and intelligent people. And just recently, unfortunately, Russia started a war in Ukraine and Russia has a very powerful propaganda machine. Um, it, Russia has been fighting a secret war for years, an information war against Ukraine, against Europe and against the Western world, especially now um, about one month, after, one month after the aggressive and illegal invasion of Russia uh, in, into Ukraine, Putin's regime is working hard uh, on justifying this unspeakable attack on, to their people. The Kremlin uh, underpinned their story um, with lies like demilitarization and denazification, which is ironic because Volodymyr Zelensky, the um, president of Ukraine himself, is a Jew. Uh, Russia recently uh, started uh, banning big uh, social media platforms like uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter based on a new law to fight, fight the fake news about the war in Ukraine. 
The Kremlin also prohibited words like invasion and assault in media. The huge influence of the Russian stories about the war can be seen on the soldiers Putin sent to war. Uh, they partially don't, didn't uh, even know that they were they'll be sent to war. Many of them thought that they are like going to training. Um, this is, of course, not the war of the Russian people. It's the war of Putin. And also, the, the propaganda also goes to TikTok, for example. Um, the Kremlin seemingly paid um, Russian influencers um, to, to make videos. And they, they basically read a, scri a script on TikTok. Um, spreading the lies of the Kremlin to convince the younger people. The, I think the average um, age on TikTok is about 14, 15, the users. But not, not all people in Russia are tricked by the government. Hundreds of brave Russians are uh, going on, on the streets and protesting against the war of the Kremlin under the risk of their freedom and freedom of their loved ones. The ban of some social media countries, uh, sorry, social media platforms, is one step further to the ultimate, to one of the ultimate goals of Vladimir Putin, the RUNET. It's a completely sealed, sealed off internet in Russia, and the consequences of this would be immense. But the Kremlin would be able to control the Russian people very easily and efficiently. Propaganda would have as much influence as in China, where they uh, already uh, control the internet. Speaking of social media. When the war started, so yeah, sorry, um, but the war is not um, where Russian propaganda started. The Kremlin also did a lot of information control during the pandemic. Uh, if we hear the conspiracy theory um, that the coronavirus is a bioweapon of the US um, against China, many of us would uh, link this with Russia. But the actual uh, origin of this lie lies in the Russian propaganda machine. In 2020, the Russian broadcaster RT, former Russian today, it changed its name in 2009 to increase its influence in the Western world. Um, spread this uh, false information intentionally to target the conspiracy theorists in the Western world. More and more sites started uh, to distributing uh, this narrative. The aim of such propaganda is almost always to attack the trust uh, in the Western world and their democracies. During COVID, the German uh, RT YouTube channel um, gained several hundreds of thousands of new subscribers and made millions of views uh, until it got taken down due to the spread of fake news about the coronavirus. Putin also has an army of internet trolls. Um, those, those are some accounts that uh, comment on posts, especially of politicians um, and po about political um, topics. Their aim is to distribute uh, Russian war propaganda and Russian propaganda in general uh, in the Western world. It's not uh, clear how many uh, of those um, fake accounts exist and how they operate and how they are organized, but which consequences such attacks can bring was, was greatly shown in the 2016 presidential election. Um, in 2015, Donald Trump announced his candidacy for presidency. And due to his brief political experience and controversial statements, um, he, he was a polarizing fi uh, figure, of course, from the beginning. Um, he symbolized a perfect precedent for Putin, uh, who sees an opportunity in Trump to divide and weaken the U.S. democracy. The troll factories um, started uh, to occupy the comment sections of, um, of on social media of Trump accounts, um, and 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 flooded them with uh, pro-Trump statements and targeted fake news. Uh, the controversy and the polarization of those posts were massively encouraged by um, the Facebook algorithms whose exact business model is the emotional content. And according to the CIA, the Kremlin Commission, uh, the hack on the Clint Hillary Clinton's private uh, email account, this uh, leak weakened uh, Clinton's presidential campaign immensely. Uh, what to do against a propaganda? One thing is to question everything, um, even your um, the, the, the sources you trust. Then you have to be cautious with your personal data, and you have to find find uh, fact-based sources like the New York Times. But you still still question everything they do, and you should be open to other um, political opinions. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we are open for questions.
We don't have any questions at the moment. I think that was a very comprehensive presentation. I'm sure people are digesting it. Maybe we'll wait for another second or so. Um, I have a question actually. I'd like to know what kind of um, education you get in Austria regarding propaganda, the use of propaganda during the Second World War. Hey, um, yes. Um, for my part, um, we had quite a lot of um, education about the, the Third Reich in, in school. In and particular? Yeah, also about propaganda. We watched a lot of documentaries. Mm -hmm. And I can remember in our history books, we had the, some pictures um, of, yeah, of, the, of the propaganda the, the, the Nazis made. Uh, we discussed them with the Congress of them. And I can also remember that we learned the origin about the, the anti Semitism and the propaganda before the Nazism. So, how like the Christian based anti Semitism. Of course, through, through my work for it, uh, Austin Source brought my um, my knowledge really, like, really gained a lot more knowledge. There's a question right here in the audience. <laughs> I think it's uh, I, I don't know the curriculum in Germany, but I think it's pretty much the same because we have the same like we, we are both perpetrate we were both perpetrators in the second world war. Um, maybe Leone, you can say something to that <laughs> if you know more. But as, as far as I know, it's uh, pretty much the same. Um, maybe also to the first question, um, it's to learn about the propaganda of the National Socialists in Austria and Germany is in part easier because of the sources. They are in German, and so there's no language barrier. Um, about education in general, it... Um, in Austria, we very much concentrate on the Austrian perspective. So I guess that's a difference to Germany um, because in Austria, it was a long process to accept the responsibility and um, to accept that Austria was not a victim of the National Socialists, but it was also a perpetrator. Uh, so that's also a large part we deal with in Austria. But I think about the propaganda, it's pretty much the same, I would assume. Um, we start in Austria with reading children's books, especially um, dealing with national socialism um, at the age of 12 or 13, I would say. So in Austria, education about the Holocaust is not only limited to history classes, but it's a part in many different subjects. So it's in literature, we read about it and it comes up in many different forms and in many different subjects. If that's answering the question. <laughs> yes. So, um, so in Austria and Germany, they've taken responsibility for their share of what happened with the Holocaust. How do you feel personally about Poland um, lately saying that it wasn't their fault? Personally, 
I think um, as we do it in, in Austria, it's um, very important to make to um, make a difference between. Um, so you have to accept all the things that happened and were committed by Austrians. Um, the, the bad things, the people fighting in the army, the people committing war crimes and um, resistance. You cannot only lean on the resistance part. Uh, so you have to show them equally or not even equally because the main part of the population was supporting it or at least not fighting against it. So <laughs> from my personal point of view, I think we can only learn from history and improve if we see history at what it is and how it really happened. Because if you only say, um, we, we didn't do anything, you don't, I think you don't feel so much the need to prevent it and really learn about it in the first place. <laughs> my opinion on that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I share the same opinion. I can't add more. <laughs> um, of course, I don't know the details, but both countries have laws that it's not allowed to um, show the symbols of national socialism in public and to publicly support um, these, uh, this ideology. So that's, that's the same in this, uh, in this way. And also like uh, the Holocaust denial is uh, of course forbidden and in both countries in Germany at the moment. But that's always a difficult discussion to prevent um, these things, um, the misuse of the ideology and on the other part, like the right of free speech, that's always a difficult political discussion, but for my personal um, opinion, it's, it's um, absolutely um, a, good, a good law that should, should be there. So we, there's no risk that people get um, influenced by it or not in, in large part by it to prevent that risk. Once again, it was very informative and we look forward to working with you for the next few months that you have remaining. Thank you. Thank you.